This week, we've seen the first potential timelines laid out for the lifting of restrictions. But with so much uncertainty still ahead, can we ever envisage a time when we will be totally free of the virus? An answer to when that day might come could lie in mathematics and in this fairly simple formula. It's all about H, the herd immunity threshold. That's the percentage of people who must be immunized in the population to stop the disease from spreading. And we can work that out if you know these two things. R naught, the reproduction number, which is how easily the virus spreads if there are no restrictions, and E, vaccine efficacy, a measure of how well the vaccine is working. Let's plug in numbers for coronavirus. We'll assume the baseline R0 is three, and we'll use an average efficacy of the two vaccines currently in use, around 79%. This gives a figure of 84% of the population that need the jab to achieve herd immunity. About 56 million people. Now, we've been immunizing 2.5 million people a week. And at that rate, we should reach herd immunity by November 2021. But our figures make huge assumptions that are tricky to pin down in the real world. Let's leave the reproduction number R0 for the moment and turn our attention to efficacy. So efficacy is a measure of how well a vaccine can protect a person from an infectious disease, in this case, COVID. If a vaccine in a clinical trial has shown to have an efficacy of, of 50%, um, this roughly tells us that we can expect those people who are vaccinated to have a 50% reduced risk of becoming sick compared to an otherwise similar unvaccinated group of people. So if I understand that correctly, it's not as though the vaccine just switches off our risk of getting the disease. It's more that it reduces the risk of us getting the disease. It kind of dials it down. Yes. Um, it, what we know, say, about um, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine is that it reduces um, disease. Uh, and what we've also seen is it reduced ho hospitalisation, so, so how severe the disease is and, and whether you need to go in, into hospital. However, the, the clinical trials that, that were done for, for all the vaccines or the majority of vaccines um, did not look at transmission, whether you can still become infected, you don't get severe disease, but you could pass that infection on to someone else. Early indications suggest the AstraZeneca vaccine may reduce transmission by around 67%. But more robust data on all the vaccines is needed. Expressing vaccine efficacy as a single exact figure like this is useful for illustration, but it's a little bit simplistic for real life. It assumes that the vaccine protects equally well against infection as disease, and that the vaccines will be just as effective in real life as they were in clinical trials. To get an idea of how even a small reduction in the real life vaccine effectiveness affects our formula, Let's see what happens if we reduce the efficacy figure by just a couple of percent. So instead of our 79%, let's use 77. If we do that, what we'll see is that the percentage of people who have to be immunized to reach herd immunity goes up from 84% to 87%. And small changes matter. This could delay when we get back to normal by weeks. And then, of course, there's R0, the reproduction number. At the beginning of the pandemic, scientists thought one infected person would, on average, infect three others. They go on to infect three more, and so it spreads through the population. But epidemiologist Mark Jitt has found that the increased transmissibility of new variants could have changed this number. 
we knew that the proportion of cases with this variant was growing in some parts of the UK. So what we did then was to take this data and say, actually, what set of parameters for this virus is consistent with what we're seeing in the world? And we found that the new variant was about 50% more transmissible. We started off with a reproduction number of three, and so 50% more of, of that would be around four, four and a half. It's difficult to say because um, we haven't seen how fast this variant spreads without any restrictions at all. But I think our sort of best guess would be about four, four and a half, yep. Let's be optimistic and use a baseline reproduction number of four. And let's keep our efficacy figure at 77%. What you'll see happening then is that our herd immunity threshold leaps up from 87% to 97%. But will we ever be able to vaccinate that many people in reality? So Roy, herd immunity actually works really well, doesn't it, with some diseases? It works very well. I mean, the best example in the United Kingdom is the introduction of measles vaccination roughly in 1967, 68. And slowly over a period of a few decades, we built up sufficient immunity in the population that measles went from 800,000 cases a year down to less than 1,000 cases a year. We eradicated the transmission of measles um, in the community. In Britain, our success against childhood measles shows that achieving very high vaccination levels against COVID-19 might be possible. But there's one other real-world thing to consider. We've got new strains coming into play. So it's important to recognise that the duration of immunity for this coronavirus vaccine set is unknown at present, and we will only find this out in subsequent years. What I do think is that we will eradicate um, serious morbidity and mortality, um, and hopefully it will become one of these things where every year, like influenza, you have a vac vaccination against it. Protecting those at risk with vaccines may allow us to live with the virus, even without herd immunity. And as we've heard this week, this protection could help us emerge from many of the current restrictions as we head towards the summer. What we all want is to be able to see and be with each other again safely. The way to get there is to make sure that population immunity is as high as possible. And vaccination means that we can all play a part.